Welcome to Dark Knight Films Reviews and another action movie night. Tonight, I will be reviewing Best of the Best Without Warning, released in 1998. Best of the Best Without Warning stars Philip Ree, Ernie Hudson, Tobin Bell, Paul Gleason, Art LaFleur, Jessica Gollins, Chris Lemon, Sven Oli Thorson, and Jessica Huang. Best of the Best Without Warning is directed by Philip Ree. Now this one was written by Philip Ree alongside Fred Vicarl. And uh, to this date, this is the final Best of the Best film, unfortunately. Um, one thing about the uh, Best of the Best films, out of all four of them, the one consistent throughout all of these films has been, of course, star Philip Ree and producer Peter E. Strauss. Um, no, it's not the actor Peter Strauss, but a producer with the same name, but it's Peter E. Strauss. Um, but yeah, they, they've... They've been the glue holding the series together all that time um, through the four films. Um, Peter was there as a producer right from the get-go, as was Philip as an actor and eventually taking over as director for the third and fourth films in this series. Now this one carries over what started with Best of the Best Two, which I didn't like where it turned it into an action film. But, I mean, since the third one and the fourth one, you know, basically already went into that territory and have veered that way, it's, you know, hard to go back to what started the series um, with just a drama about um, a tournament. So, this one... Um, it's hit and miss. Um, I guess some really good performances um, by Ernie Hudson um, playing Detective Grasco. And uh, he, he just is enjoying the hell out of playing this kind of a douchebag detective character that's still a good detective. He's just a douchebag. You know, smoking can kill you. What's that supposed to mean? Uh, why are you being such an asshole? Asshole? Let me explain something. My age and me go, I'm a good guy. I serve, I protect. That's my job. And then you have Tobin Bell playing the villain, um, Lucas Slava. And uh, he's a different type of villain than what he plays in the Saw films. Um, but he is very good in this film his his scenes in which they show him at his little mansion that he lives at won't happen again sir i agree i completely agree <laughs> it's a very um roger moore villainish um style um because I say Roger Moore because Roger Moore's villains in the James Bond series were more um, this style as opposed to the Sean Connery style where they were just more over-the-top villains in there. Um, most of Roger Moore's ones were more, they're hanging at their, you know, big fancy place and, and they've got men around that they're giving orders to and, and uh, they're played a little less um, campy and everything and they're just more just enjoying their villainy um, as opposed to just camping it up and that's what Tobin Bell does in this. His name is Tommy Lee. I checked with our little birdie at the police department. <laughs> Very resourceful, Morris. Very resourceful. He, he feels like a uh, Bond villain from the era of the Roger Moore films. Um, 
Paul Gleason um, plays a character named Father Gill in this, and it's one of the rare occasions where Paul Gleason's playing a decent guy. He's playing this um, priest, Father Gill, and he's just such a good guy. It's like, wow, why did they never give him that many chances to do something like that before? He's usually playing, you know, the, the douchebag characters and everything and, um, in films. But I guess that's what he excelled at, so he kind of got typecast in those kind of roles. But in here he shows that he, he could play some really uh, good-natured good guys in films. You take care. God bless you. Art LaFleur, I've always loved. He plays in this as uh, Big Julie. And he is, in the scenes he's in, he's just so charismatic and cool. I could have robbed this place and do it in heaven. I know where you live, Tony. Besides, I got a cannon under the counter for such an inevitable occasion. Unfortunately, his character you know, doesn't last long in the film. And that's unfortunate um, because I was really enjoying his character. Um, Jessica Collins plays Karina, the girlfriend to uh, Tobin Bell's Lucas Slava's brother. And uh, she gives a pretty good performance, but she's playing the bad girl, of course. And... Uh, she kind of gets torn when she meets uh, Tommy in the film. Are you always this caring? Then you have Chris Lemon playing Detective Jack Jarvis, Ernie Hudson's character's partner. Um, and uh, he starts off a decent enough character. Uh, but the idiotic twist that they take him through basically eliminates his character from the story fairly early, uh, which is a shame because he, you know, being the son of um, Jack Lemmon, he has a lot of that likability um, already in him. Tommy, how you doing? You gonna be okay? Yeah. Yeah. All right, look, go home. Try to relax. We'll contact him when you get an ID on the perm, all right? because he's learned it from his dad, basically. And uh, he could have been a very likable character, but they end up, um, spoiler alert, um, they end up making him a turncoat who is working with Tobin Bell's character uh, within the police department. What are friends for? It was it was stupid, I think, and, and it was a waste of what could have been a really good actor in this film. Um, Sven Oli Thorson, um, really great supporting actor, plays a character of Boris in there, and I always felt watching Sven as an actor that um, he always came off with the vibe of what he he could have been just as good in the leading roles as Arnold Schwarzenegger ever was. And he always br b gave off that same vibe of, you know, the snarky, smart-ass um, get, getting the one-liners in there. And in fact, he gets it in this. What's going on? Right, shotgun. I mean, his delivery of that line was, you know, this, it felt just like, you know, the same thing that, uh, that you get with Arnold Schwarzenegger. And that's what made Arnold Schwarzenegger so uh, beloved um, was his uh, ability to do those one-liners so dryly like that. And Sven had that talent, too, but he just never was given the opportunity to play... Um, leads in anything and that's that's a shame i th i think he had because he was he was a big guy he was strong he would usually play villains against 
Arnold Schwarzenegger or um, Dolph Lundgren or other big actors in the industry, even Jean-Claude Van Damme in a couple of films. Um, I'll even Steven Seagal, he was a villain in um, one of his films. Uh, I think the scene that I just showed uh, is one of his one of his best in any of his films um, that he's ever done. Um, and it just shows that if a producer had just given him this the starring role to lead the film, he could have pulled it off in the same way that Arnold Schwarzenegger did. Ironically, two of the weaker performances in this film um, come from Philip Perry himself. I think this is the weakest performance um, of his playing the character of Tommy Lee. Um, I don't think his performance in this is as strong as it was in the previous three films. Um, and uh, Jessica Huang, um, who plays Stephanie Lee, um, Tommy Lee's character's daughter in this film. Uh, I don't think it's her fault. I imagine she's a fine child actor, but I don't think um, Philip, as a director, gave her um, enough direction to emote and put out anything in here. Daddy, what's wrong? Nothing's wrong, love. Let's go. Daddy, my monkey! I think in certain scenes she's okay, um, but at certain scenes, it, it, it's the moments where, as a director, Philip should have did another take on it because it felt like th this was just an early take on the, on the scene and he just let it go. What if something happens to you? Nothing's gonna happen to me. Promise? I promise. Which uh, is unfortunate. Um, another criticism I'll make toward um, Best of the Best Without Warning. Um, at the beginning of the film, there is this sequence in which this uh, sort of helicopter kind of thing comes through the city and it lowers down these straps that they strap around this uh, trailer at the, at the back of this diesel semi. And uh, then they lift it up in the air and take it away. And it is so apparent in this sequence. It is a remote control fake helicopter shot in front of like a green screen or some shit. And then they put it in front of the actual scenes and stuff and then tried to put visual effects to make it look like it's real. And uh, it just looks, it looks atrocious. It looks fake. Thankfully, that is the only really bad visual effects in this, other than one little sequence near the end, which is mild, um, in which, you know, Boris drives the semi into the tunnel and Tommy slides the motorcycle underneath it and then he collides with the cars and, and the um, tanker behind his semi blows up and it ends up blowing up the helicopter as well. And uh, th these effects are, you know, you can tell it's, yeah, it's visual effects, it's not real. Um, but it's not quite as bad as that early parts. And, and I can see why this sequence, uh, they went in this way because, I mean, it could have been dangerous and could have killed the helicopter pilot trying to do this kind of a stunt. So, um, the other thing that annoyed me throughout this film was the um, constant use of slow motion during the fight sequences. And it's completely unnecessary. Some of the best fight sequences in films even in this series, are the ones that are in real time when we see the stuff happen in real time. And those moments that happen in this film are fine. They are great. But then you have moments where all of a sudden it'll just, for no fucking reason, it will go into this slow motion sequence. 
and it really takes, it, for me, it really took me out of um, those sequences and it just made me go, what the hell are you doing? Stop slowing it down. Um, but that's a minor nitpick, I guess. Um, but overall, I think this had potential to be um, the best of the action film, best of the best films. Um, but yeah, lackluster performance by Philip Ree um, kind of brings it down. And uh, like I said, some of the visuals. Um, uh, like I said, great performance by Ernie Hudson and Tobin Bell and Paul Gleason, Art LaFleur, Jessica Collins, um, and Sven Ole Thorson. But, yeah. But the rest of the film is kind of lackluster. Um, so I am going to give Best of the Best Without Warning from 1998. I am going to give this film a... 7.5 out of 10. Um, it, I, I can actually see why this was the last film in this series. And I can see why Philip in interviews after this said that uh, and he regretted doing this one and it was more um, doing it for the money. Um, well, it shows in your performance and some of your direction in this too, Philip, so... Um, but what do you guys think of Best of the Best without warning? Do you agree with my review? Do you disagree? Let me know in those comments down below. And if you enjoyed this video, do not forget to like, share, and subscribe. And don't forget to click that bell icon so you can be notified about future videos just like this one. And while you're by the subscribe button, click that join button and become a Dark Knight fan. Well, that's it for another action movie night. If you missed last week's action movie night, check out the link above to get caught up on that one. And if you've missed any other videos, check out this down here where you can watch a playlist of any of our action movie nights that you have missed.